Yeah, well, it's not surprising, it shouldn't be, that if we are trying to understand a problem called insulin resistance, we probably should measure insulin. And that's where <laughs> so many clinicians have been, um, have been, well, I would say poorly educated. You know, we only know what, we, what we've learned. And so it's not, it's not fair of me to expect everyone to know what I know, just like I don't know what anyone else would know. Um, but yeah, with regards to insulin resistance, some tests that I would encourage any clinician to do, one would just be measuring fasting insulin. And if the fasting insulin levels are above six microunits per mil, that's a concern or it's a reason to do the additional tests that I'll mention. Um, um, one of the easier ones to do is the triglyceride to HDL ratio. And that is just triglycerides divided by HDL. And if that number is higher than around 1.5 or 2, and there's some um, differences across ethnicities, which is why we have to be a little more careful with that one, um, just inherent differences. But nevertheless, if that number is higher than about two, that's a red flag. Um, another one that's very, very predictive um, is the triglyceride glucose index. And this is one that just keeps getting, I'm amazed at how many papers just keep coming out about this one. And it's a little more of a complicated formula, so anyone could look it up. But the nice thing about the triglyceride glucose index is that we always get those numbers. We always get glucose. We always get triglycerides, just like we always get HDL. So that other ratio I just mentioned is helpful. And then my favorite one, um, but it requires measure another atypical marker, which is free fatty acids. We don't normally measure free fatty acids. Now, you and I know this, but I just want to pause for just a second and just teach this because I'm amazed at how many of my own students, you know, university students who've gone through nutrient metabolism courses, they don't know the difference between free fatty acids and triglycerides. So tri a tr the triglyceride number on the clinical test is the amount of the actual molecule. Well, it's kind of a ratio. It's a kind of an assumed number. This, the amount of this stored version of, of fat that is moving through the blood on lipoproteins like chylomicron or VLDL or LDL. That's how the triglycerides are carried. And it's a fraction of those um, that we rely on to give us the number of the, the triglycerides number. Free fatty acids are products of fat metabolism. That's when the fat cells are breaking down their triglycerides, taking this, these fatty acids, three of them that are linked together and pulling them off one at a time through a process called lipolysis. And so free fatty acids are a reflection of the amount of fat that's being broken down from fat cells to be burned by the body normally. And what happens is this, in, it is, which is one of the reasons I love it so much, because it's both reflective of nutrient metabolism and it brings the target on the fat cell, which I think is initially the most important cell in the progression towards insulin resistance. So when insulin is high, as you noted in, in the lectures you learned about, um, insulin will inhibit fat breakdown. It inhibits lipolysis. So if an individual is eating a bagel, for example, their insulin is high, their free fatty acids will be low. That's what you'd see. Now give the person six or seven hours, insulin's all gone, they're now in a fasted state, insulin will be down and free fatty acids will start creeping up because there's this disinhibition of lipolysis. Now, in other words, lipolysis can operate freely. So these two should always be in opposites. If insulin's high, free fatty acids are down or vice versa. However, when the fat cell has undergone significant hypertrophy, it's grown, and this was somewhat reflective of how I started this conversation, saying that when the fat cell gets big, it becomes pro-inflammatory. It becomes pro-inflammatory to actually try to correct a reduction in blood flow as the fat cells are too far from blood vessels. But at the same time, as the fat cell has swelled to about 10 times its normal volume, which is, which is unlike any other cell in the body, no other cell is capable of that degree of, of hypertrophy in an adult. But at that point, the cell is getting so big that even though insulin keeps telling the fat cell to continue to grow, the fat cell stops listening and now starts leaking out fat. In other words, you now have a state where insulin is high, reflective of the insulin resistant body, but now also free fatty acids are high, reflective of an insulin resistant fat cell. 